morning, everybody. We're just going to give it a couple more minutes and we will get started. Great. Well, welcome everybody to the California Master Plan for Aging Impact Stakeholder Committee. Thank you so much for being here. And before we get started and dive into the content, I want to have uh, just a, a few brief moments for some quick logistics reminders. Fantastic. We're continuing to meet uh, virtually, and this meeting is available by Zoom. You can dial in on your telephone or join us from your computer, tablet, or smartphone. American Sign Language Interpretation and live closed captioning is available. You should see our sign language interpreters on your screen, and you can select the live transcript or the CC icon from your toolbar to enable captioning. Uh, lastly, meeting slides, the recording and transcript will be posted to the California Health and Human Services Master Plan for Aging webpage. And with that, I will pass it off to Kim McCoy Wade from the governor's office. Good morning and happy new year. Thank you so much. Kim, we may have we may have lost your audio. Kim, are you muted? Kim, we're not able to hear you. We're reaching out to Kim to let her know the audio isn't coming through for us. Great, and Kim, uh, Kim is going to troubleshoot. Uh, I'm not sure why the audio disconnected, but uh, Susan, I'm wondering if I can toss it to you. You can toss it to me while Kim figures that out. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Is it letting me on here? No, it's still is that somebody else's okay. voice. Can I turn on? Oh, that's Kim. Oh, is it Kim? Okay. Great. We'll go back to Kim. No? Okay. Nope. I'll go, I'll go ahead. So welcome everybody. We're so grateful to usher in the new year with you as members of the Impact Stakeholder Committee and as key partners in the master plan work yet to be done. Uh, this week, as I hope you all know, we celebrate the one year anniversary of the official launch of the plan, our plan. And we also welcome today new leaders and new energy, Dr. Elizabeth Edgerly, who joins the Impact Committee today. Welcome Elizabeth. Kim McCoy Wade, who we'll hear from momentarily in her critical role as the senior advisor to the governor on aging, disability, and Alzheimer's, a first for California. Uh, this morning, Sarah Steenhausen was sworn in at the Department of Aging as the deputy director of aging policy, research, and equity, a first for CDA. And Blanca Castro, California's newly appointed long-term care ombudsman, who will navigate congregate care settings with a laser focus on residents. As we look forward with anticipation to the governor's proposed budget, a far reaching plan that both integrates and embeds aging and disability into a host of agencies, departments and programs, but also explicitly calls out our population for focused attention and investments. Today marks the start of a two way dialogue on budget priorities and we really want to hear from you as our advisor within the meeting today and ongoing through the budget process. I want to especially thank Marco Meach and Darcy Delgado, who will be joining us to lead the budget discussion. 
As we've experienced throughout the master plan process, our exuberance is tempered by reality. California and the nation are in the throes of the Omicron surge. Still today, older adults, people with disabilities and communities of color continue to be at highest risk of infection and poor outcomes, including death. Yesterday's Martin Luther King Jr. holiday reminded me how far we still have to go to realize true equality, justice, and equity. And yesterday's holiday also renewed my hope and our collective strength. I'm so glad that we have each other to hold on to Together, through the mix of emotions of celebration and grieving this week, in this meeting, and in the months ahead. Our agenda allows time today to discuss the critical role of this impact stakeholder committee and how we will work together to drive implementation of the master plan. And together we will produce real results for real people. And now I hope Kim's audio is working and we can invite her back to share her remarks. Do we have Kim with us? Susan, I'm seeing that Kim's with us. I don't know that we have her audio. She might still be troubleshooting. Okay, great. So Maria, in that case, let's just keep moving through the agenda. And I know, um, great. So here we are. Um, our lineup of all of our impact committee members and Kim when you when you do have audio just interrupt us and let us know and we'll we'll um, pivot. Um, I want to welcome all of the members of this committee Elizabeth Edgerly, Andy Imperato, Nancy McPherson, Sarita Mahantney, Mahanti, Doug Moore, and Sharon Nevins. I hope you're with us today Sharon, Kevin Prindeville, Kieran Savage. Yes, good morning. And Good morning, Sharon is here. I'm on the phone because I'm having audio difficulties. So as soon as I'm able to get it corrected, I'll be joining you yes, live. Can you hear me? Wonderful. Thank you, Sharon, for letting us know that. And Dr. Fernando Torres-Gill, welcome to all of our impact committee members. This is our agenda for today. We're packing a lot into two hours. Um, we want to make the best use of your time and our time together. So if this, Kim is not... Is yeah, it sounded like Kim might have rejoined by the phone. Do you want to just check one more time to see if we have Kim's audio? Great. Is that you, Kim? I thought I heard her. Maybe I didn't. Sorry. No problem. So at this point, um, we'd like to talk about the governor's proposed budget released uh, a week ago on January 10th. And do we have Marco and Darcy with us for this segment? Hi, Susan, can you hear me okay? Yes, we hear you, Marco. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Well, um, it's such a pleasure to be here with you um, for just a few minutes. And I wanna first start by, I know many of you, but uh, not all of you. My name is Marco Meech, I'm the Undersecretary at the Health and Human Services Agency, and I am joined by my colleague Darcy Delgado, who is an Assistant Secretary and covers the aging portfolio, so uh, really thrilled to have her with us. To all of you, just a huge sense of gratitude and thanks for making the time uh, to be here with us. I'm so stoked to have Sarah on our team now. Sarita, we are so sorry. Don't hate us for life, but um, we're grateful that we were able to steal her. And um, I am just so excited to see what she'll be able to do at the Department of Aging um, with Susan DeMaris's leadership. Uh, and I'm just so stoked to also have uh, Blanca in her new role as the state ombudsman, uh, uh, ombudswoman, to be clear. Uh, and I'm really excited about her role and responsibility in terms of just helping us shape out um, what we're about to do. 
I, uh, you know, this has been quite a journey for many of us. Um, we started this a couple of years back now, and it is just so um, heartening to see how much progress has been made. Uh, what I love most about this is that um, we've had a variety of different evolutions and this, the, 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 um, uh, the Master Plan for Aging St Stakeholder Advisory Committee um, really evolved and, and has helped us uh, throughout the entire pandemic. And I, I just wanna, for just a moment, acknowledge Kevin Prindeville at um, the Justice and Aging for his work in keeping the committee going uh, post us kind of sunsetting it. Um, and really helping us, to be honest with you, in terms of our response to COVID-19. There were some really difficult conversations at time, but I think some honest conversations, and I'm just really grateful. And that leads us to this point, which is this impact committee. The goal here was really to create a smaller subset of individuals who could be advisors to us as we uh, continue our implementation process. And I'm just really excited about uh, continuing the drumbeat of our work together. I think this is such an, op uh, such an incredible opportunity for us to continue the work that we've started. Uh, and I'm just really thrilled to see how organic this has evolved and how much momentum we've received within the community. We started this by saying that this is a whole of society effort and really it has turned into a whole of society effort. And as many of you know, I hate strategic plans and the fact that this is really a living document that continues to live and get iterated on is what we're really excited about. So I'm, I'm really um, uh, stoked about that. Before I kind of jump into a few pieces related to the budget and Darcy's gonna help me with one particular piece that she's done a tremendous job um, with, I do wanna spend a moment just giving you kind of an update on where we are with COVID-19 uh, in particular, because I think it's something that we continue to spend a lot of time on. So what we are seeing right now is a pretty significant spike in cases related to the Omicron variant. This is uh, very similar to what we experienced, uh, what folks experienced in South Africa, as well as in the United Kingdom and as in other parts of Europe. We have been in communication with those health officials uh, through most of December and January to make sure that we uh, learned from their experiences. What they saw was a precipitous or a significant increase in the precipitous decline in cases and what we're seeing right now is um, some early glimmers of hope with regards to our, our ability to be coming down from a, a rather high peak in cases. What we know right now is that uh, the Omicron variant is much more transmissible, but less virulent than the Delta variant. And so what, that is, what does that mean? It means that it is infecting more people, but is, the impact on those individuals is lighter uh, what we also know is that those individuals who are vaccinated are significantly less likely to be hospitalized uh, and be put on a ventilator as a result of the Omicron variant. And those individuals who are boosted have the most protection. Uh, and the data continues to bear that out over the weekend. The secretary was briefed by the CDPH team looking at the uh, effectiveness of the vaccine, and we continue to see high effectiveness with regards to, uh, you know, uh, severity of disease onset as well as uh, hospitalization and or ICU admission. So the vast majority of individuals who end up in the hospital are those individuals that are unvaccinated. There are cases of individuals who are vaccinated, but it tends to be individuals who have uh, various comorbidities. Uh, and we're trying to decipher, are those individuals in the hospital for COVID-19 or with COVID-19, which is a very big differentiation. And I think um, we're continuing to work through some of those data elements to really understand uh, kind of what that's doing to impact our hospital system. So um, I think that we're seeing some glimmers of hope. Our efforts are really focused around testing and vaccine administration. Boosting is going to be an important factor. Uh, the, the immune uh, 
response with a boost is pretty significant right away. And so we're continuing to encourage individuals to get boosted as quickly as possible. And that continues to be part of our messaging uh, throughout our efforts at the Health and Human Services Agency in our department. So that's just a little bit about COVID. I do want to spend a moment just kind of highlighting some efforts that have happened over the course of the last couple of weeks. Uh, one being we have approval from our federal partners to implement CalAIM, which is a really, really big thing. And the negotiation um, was not easy and a huge thanks to Secretary Galley, Director Michelle Boss, and our Medicaid Director, uh, JC Cooper, who spent many, many, many hours negotiating with the federal government around the nuances of CalAIM, but we're really excited about that. Our home and community-based services um, components that we included post the last budget also were approved by the federal government and we're really excited about those two anchors of what we look to do with regards to our work in transforming uh, many of the things that we're working on here at the agency. So we're really stoked about kind of the, the building blocks that we're building uh, that are a true anchor with regards to uh, the master plan for aging. At the Health and Human Services Agency, we say, we call this kind of our puzzle piece. There are multiple pieces of the puzzle that we're trying to put together. And the person is at the center of that puzzle. We're really trying to pull the puzzle together for the individual we're trying to serve. And so uh, CalAIM and HCBS and the Master Plan for Aging are all those intersections that are coming together really nicely, but uh, a lot more work that needs to be done uh, in the space. And as you probably also saw with regards to the budget, um, we are including a 24% increase in the SSP grant, which is gonna go a long way. Also, the, it, we are coming up from a deficit, but we're trying to really make that up with regards to SSP uh, to, to make sure that folks have uh, those funds available to them as well, in addition to a number of other things that are part of our budget package. The one thing that I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about, and, and I'm going to turn it over to Darcy in a minute, and then we can certainly um, add uh, some time for questions and answers for you all, is really kind of leaning in on the idea of workforce. On the health side, we have seen a pretty significant impact with regards to workforce over the course of the pandemic. Uh, many individuals are tired. Uh, our healthcare workers are working tirelessly day in and day out in a, a host of facilities, whether that's hospital or acute care level facilities, many of the long-term care facilities that we talk a lot about amongst this group in particular. But we are also seeing a pretty significant strain in other areas, whether it's behavioral health workers who are doing heroic work with regards to being able to provide services to individuals in the pandemic. Many of us have been impacted with regards to the pandemic and just our own behavioral health and mental health uh, uh, conditions. We also see just a significant impact in terms of our human services programs, so social workers and other individuals who are really providing care within the community or an, an, an extension of the healthcare worker. And so we are really trying to double down on the idea of looking at the health and human services workforce and what we can do to really amplify that work over the course of the next year to two years to be able to deliver on the initiatives that we're talking about as part of the master plan for aging. So the budget included a $1.7 billion investment on uh, health and human services workforce. And this was done in partnership with the labor and work Workforce Development Agency, uh, both two secretaries who are very committed and passionate about this work. And we've come together with our teams to really think about um, how we lean in on some of those aspects. And so I'm going to ask Darcy to just spend a little bit of time because this is such a, a big deal and a mo momentous occasion in terms of kind of the, the foundation of our work together to spend a little bit of time talking about the different components that are in the budget related to workforce. And then we'll really end with um, an, a hopefully a little bit of time to engage with you in a conversation about the things that are important um, uh, to you all. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague Darcy to just kind of walk you through that and then we'll close out uh, and look to take some questions from all of you. Darcy. 
Awesome. Thanks, Marco. Good morning, everybody. So as Marco mentioned, uh, the proposed budget investments that the governor spoke about last week are just a really exciting effort specifically uh, to lift up the care economy workforce. As Marco mentioned, um, at now coming on to two years of the pandemic, the exhaustion, the fatigue, the burnout is just uh, at a level that we've never seen before. And so really excited about the opportunities that, the, that this proposal uh, gives into our workforce. Um, and as Marco mentioned, uh, a collaboration with Labor and Workforce Development Agency and peeking at the agenda for today, it looks like um, in one of the uh, panel discussions later this morning, you're going to hear from Abby Snay, who was an who is an amazing partner in these efforts and really will be able to speak to a lot of the, uh, a lot of the items we'll be talking about today. Next slide, please. Okay, $1.7 billion over three years. Really, I mean, we can stop the slide deck right there. The amount of uh, financial investment that, that the governor and that uh, our agencies are proposing really speaks to the importance of this issue. I think that I've heard Marco and Secretary Galley say a few times that, that they don't go to any meetings without folks talking about the critical issues that we're facing in uh, labor workforce shortages right now. And so really understanding that the goal of these dollars is to try to uh, recruit train, hire, and advance an improved workforce that really has uh, specifically improvements in diversity. And um, that can be seen really, and we'll, we'll talk about it in upcoming slides, but, but we know through research that um, when your provider, for example, looks like you, has lived experience and shares a lot of the personal characteristics that you have, that you will have improved outcomes. And so to really be able to expand the diversity of our healthcare workforce is one of the main goals of the dollars and the programs that we'll be talking a little bit about today. Next slide, please. Um, so don't need to say it to this group, but really the need right now is urgent. We talked about the impact of the pandemic, the fatigue, the burnout, and we know that um, that our economic recovery and the economic uh, importance of the healthcare workforce is also a very important issue that uh, in, that is impacted by these dollars and by the current needs. And really that third bullet point is what I was talking about earlier, which is that lack of representation and diversity in our workforce uh, can really, has left a lot to be improved. Next slide. So we talked about how it's $1.7 billion. Oh, thanks, Andy. That's a great question. We'll hit that in a second. Um, Andy, for those who can't see in the chat, ask the question, what does uh, people with lived experience mean? Great question, Andy. We'll get that. Um, so the, what the next slide shows, and uh, we will talk about in a little bit more depth, but just to say that the, these proposals are, um, you know, bullet pointed out in this slide deck, but so much more information that we are able to share and that uh, happy to talk about and take some questions on. So the first uh, initiative is the what we call the 25 by 25 initiative. And this is an effort that Secretary Galley is uh, particularly excited about and is $350 million in the general fund to expand uh, what we are calling uh, the community health workers, the community health worker project and to certify 25,000 new community health workers by 2025. And that these individuals will have the potential to be providing services in a number of different areas, um, climate health, homelessness, dementia, behavioral health, all of these areas in which we know have been lacking uh, in, in workforce uh, capacity over the past few years. And that in working with our partners, um, partners within Health and Human Service Agency to ensure that these uh, individuals, these community health workers will uh, be Medi-Cal billable so, such that we can end up integrating them into our health care workforce system. Um, the next bullet point is the High Road Training Partnership. This is an existing program. Uh, if you aren't familiar with it, um, you can uh, do a quick search on the LWDA's um, 
website and find out a little bit more about the High Road Training Partnership. But it is a pretty successful program that is able to uh, train and provide for uh, workforce programs for people who have experienced institutional barriers to employment. And so um, these are individuals who just need an extra leg up to try to get involved into the workforce system. And so excited about that dollars going into that program. Something that I think um, individuals who are invested in the aging community will be particularly excited about are the nursing initiatives that are proposed in this workforce development package. Um, $270 million in general fund to really try to expand the scope of nursing. And you'll see all of the different categories of individuals who are listed there, uh, categories of positions that are listed there, but again, Super exciting efforts and super excited um, about the investment in nursing. Next slide, please. Okay, a little bit uh, closer to my heart. I'm a psychologist by training, so really excited about these next two bullet points. Um, in the uh, proposed budget that the governor spoke about last week, um, we have two line items for uh, focus on one on social work and one for psychiatric residency programs. And so we do know, as Marco mentioned, that the, the, the secondary uh, anxiety, depression, PTSD that individuals are experiencing due to the pandemic is really only going to uh, increase as the years go on and really understanding that this aspect of our behavioral care workforce is just um, crucial to the success of many of our programs. And so the investment in both social work and the psychiatric residency program will allow us to expand, expand services in those areas. Um, and finally, the multilingual health initiatives, uh, which you can see listed there at the bottom, is really uh, has a goal of increasing language and cultural competency throughout, throughout our workforce. And so, yes, I'm excited about the social work investment too, Gil. Um, the multilingual health initiative, again, understanding, going back to what we talked about earlier, um, we know that when services are provided in um, somebody's native language, that they are more effective services. And so how can we as an agency really um, expand our workforce pool to include individuals who have language and cultural competencies so that they can better provide services to our fellow Californians. Um, so those are the initiatives. Uh, like I said, there is a lot more information available and happy to answer any questions. I know that one uh, came through earlier, um, which uh, from Andy, which saying people, uh, a question about lived experience. And so um, Andy asked, what does people with lived experience mean? And so what we mean by that, Andy, is just uh, we know substance abuse is a great area um, to use that as, as an example. We know that people who have lived experience with substance abuse are able to provide quite effective uh, substance abuse counselor training or service provision to individuals who are in recovery because their own lived experience is able to um, help individuals who are working through their own recovery. We know in a similar fashion, people who have... Uh, Thing, who have different types of mental illness are able to provide uh, services to individuals with um, mental illness themselves and that their lived experience uh, is able to provide a more effective um, type of treatment and type of approach. And so the, that's what we mean by lived experience. Um, RC, I just want to also, uh, Kira ha Kieran had a, a good question around the community health worker piece. So uh, that is going to be a partnership between HCI, uh, formerly known as Ashped, and DHCS. And the reason why DHCS, as many of you know, is that last year's budget, we included a benefit uh, for community health workers. And so we are looking to really link those two up. So we're looking at bringing up the workforce while at the same time leveraging federal dollars to fund that in an ongoing way. And so Michelle and Elizabeth Landsberg are really working together uh, to try to figure out how we align those two things as much as we possibly can so we can leverage the federal dollars to the fullest extent possible. So uh, I think we want to, Darcy, thank you so much. We'd love to just kind of engage in a conversation with you all about just this and our broader work at the Health and Human Services Agency. I will just say, 
I know that folks are lining up with, with their ra hands raised and Darcy and I are happy to take questions. The secretary is super stoked and he's really excited about all of these pieces. He's super excited to have you all be part of this work moving forward. He's grateful to each of you. He's excited uh, to celebrate the one year anniversary with you all uh, uh, at the end of this month. So just really a huge sense of gratitude and thanks to each of you for rolling up your sleeves and being willing to help us in such a tremendous way. So with that, I see a number of different hands and I'm gonna, uh, uh, Darcy and I will take them in order. So uh, Dr. Torres Gill, we'll start with you and then we'll move to Gill and then Andy. I, I believe Kevin was first. I'll let Kevin go first. Oh man. <laughs> Oh, there we go. Uh, well, thanks, Fernando. <laughs> um, so thank you, uh, Marco and Darcy, for uh, the presentation. Um, and, and there's definitely a lot to be excited about here in this budget generally for the state. I really appreciate the focus that uh, the administration is putting on, um, on equity, um, on, on really making you know, strong investments in lots of different ways for our communities broadly. Um, that said, I think that our reaction to the budget here, Justice Nugent, was, was we appreciated a lot of what was in there that was good, but given the strong financial outlook of the state, the, the strong um, revenue, the, the surplus again this year, we were expecting a bigger investment specifically in the needs of older adults and people with disabilities. Um, you outlined like some big investments like in workforce, um, there's some investments in housing, there's some response to COVID that certainly could and should impact older adults and people with disabilities positively, but that impact is not called out explicitly much in the governor's comments and the summary documents. Um, and we've seen that in the past when our communities aren't specifically called out, called out aren't specifically invested in, the investments don't make it there. Um, that our communities aren't always top of mind um, of policymakers, of folks that are implementing these policies. And so, for example, the workforce stuff that you outlined really directly connects to the master plan for aging goals. One of the five goals is about the workforce. Um, and the master plan for aging included specific ideas and parts of that workforce that needed to be developed for older people. Yet this $1.7 billion investment doesn't connect those dots. There's call outs in, in what you just shared, Darcy, and in the budget documents of you know, very specific um, investments in health workers and the high road training partnerships and the nursing and the, you know, um, many of the things you, you called out opioid treatment, really, you know, reproductive health and all investments that we support. And we'd like to see some really specific call out of the parts of the aging and disability workforce that have been least developed in our state, specifically around home and community based services. So the, the lack of a mention of services for older people and people with disabilities, in particular, the direct care workforce is concerning to us and we're really looking forward to working with you to create specific investments in the workforce area for the parts of the aging and disability infrastructure that have been least developed and and and, and that's maybe a theme for our sense of other parts of the budget you know, there are some good investments in the master plan for aging there are some good investments in, in dementia programs the size and scale of those investments frankly seems small relative to the overall um, positive outlook in this budget. And, and I'll note that you know, the budget outlook is very positive. The one place where aging actually does get discussed the most is in downside risk of the budget. And in, in the section talking about downside risks of our budget um, is the talk about our aging population and the downside risk that that poses for the state's financial outlook. Yet you, can, you can't really trace investments in this current budget to that population to help present, prevent that, or even leverage that risk as an opportunity, really, right? Investing in workforce, investing in uh, opportunities to serve older adults in new and different ways that help um, counter some of the, the potential uh, risk that's talked about in the budget. So we, you know, we're excited to work with you all on those things that are proposed here. And we're excited to be working with you in the legislature between now and the May revise and, and beyond to come up with some more targeted investments for older adults and people with disabilities. And, and I'll make one other point. We'd really like to see more on home and community-based services. And we'd really like to see more that, that shows that there was lessons learned from the COVID crisis and the impact on older people, that we're now investing in those communities differently in response to COVID. Um, and to us, the, the theme we've had with you all as a master planning plan for aging group throughout is 
we've got to build up that home and community-based services infrastructure. We knew that before COVID, we knew it, we know it even more now. And we're not seeing a lot in this budget, which is reflecting that lesson learned. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so, I mean, I think to unpack a, a number of different things that you said there, I think that the way we see this budget is that it is part of kind of a, the last two budget cycles and it's intended to build on top of each, they're, they're intended to build on top of each other. I think um, if you look at the HHSA pages, if you look at the HHS summary document that we issued, there is a, 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 a direct kind of outline of kind of the aging components. Is it what we all wanted? Absolutely not. Could we have done more? Absolutely. But I think um, to, to say that we didn't do enough or didn't do uh, justice with regards to kind of connecting the dots, I think part of it is also on you all to help us think through how we uh, tie those pieces together and ways in which we talk about it. It's not, it can't, it can't just be left to us to carry the water, right? Um, I think that we're doing, um, we're pulling together the different pieces, but I wouldn't look at this budget in isolation. This is intended to build on top of what we've done over the course of the last three years. Um, and I think there's always more to be done and we're looking to do more over the course of the next couple of years. But I think that um, there's just a lot of progress that I think we've made collectively. And you know we're certainly proud of that. Uh, and I think that the HCBS plan alone that we submitted to the federal government is probably, uh, you know, I, I mean, pushed the envelope pretty significantly. And there was some significant back and forth with the federal government around, you know, their comforts around what we were trying to do. But uh, it wasn't for a lack of trying and it wasn't for a lack of innovation or, or motivation to be able to push the needle in the space uh, even further. So I think what, what I will just say to your comments is that you know, I think that we would look to you all to help us even further. I think that's the premise of having this group. Um, and I think that, you know, we, I, I just would encourage folks to really look at this as building blocks and that these things uh, are intended to build on top of each other over the last couple of years. Marco, I'll just add one thing to that too. And Kevin, I'm gonna blame my dog for this because he started barking. I gave him a chew stick, but yet still starts barking right when I was started talking. Uh, but I did have a big note that I completely missed because I was worried about my dog barking uh, to say that we know that the master plan for aging really has a recommendation for a workforce solution table. And that that is a, a critical piece of the master plan for aging and really um, <coughs> want to encourage as many folks as possible to, to come to that table when it comes to a lot of these workforce dollars. We are going to be using the HKI uh, workforce group in terms of really trying to flush out a lot of these, a lot of these protocols. The interpreter, of these can, can you clarify the HKI? Could you spell that out, please? I'm sorry, it's uh, HCAI. Um, it's a department with health and human services, my apologies. And so really want to kind of make that connection between that piece of the master plan for aging, the workforce solutions table that you all um, have as a high priority and really try to partner those such that we can ensure, like you said, Kevin, that um, with so many different efforts listed in that that aging doesn't um, fall down in priority and um, really hope that many of you can be a voice at that table as we push those initiatives through. Thanks, right. Kevin. I think we can move over, uh, Fernando. Yes, just building on, on Kevin's uh, comments. And again, we're excited about this uh, tremendous investment. And in the case of social work, um, just to give an example of kind of building on the comments, how we might target towards those areas that build on the master plan on aging and earlier investment in social work, for example, whether it's uh, Berkeley, USC, UCLA, or the Cal State, we find that most students will naturally gravitate to mental health and child welfare, which is great. And we have training programs already in place to provide stipends and tuition, et cetera. Where we find it difficult is to entice students to move into geriatric social work 
or to work with persons with disability. We don't have those stipends or training programs in that area. So to the extent some of these funds could be targeted towards, I'm making it up, a California geriatric disability social work investment, that will enable us in these various great programs throughout California to get more students to take an interest in social work training and education and help us build up that workforce for the groups that this master plan is about. So I'd like to suggest that as one example of targeting some of those great dollars. No, I think that's great feedback. And, you know, we're building this out now. And so this type of feedback is excellent. And we would love to follow up with you around how we think about that more holistically. So Darcy, we'd love to get back with you and this group and uh, as a whole to just think about, but, th but this feedback and what you just said is exactly the type of feedback we're looking for. Andy? Yeah, I, I just put a comment um, I wasn't sure we would have time to get into it, but I, I think people with lived experience is not really a term of art. And if, if you mean people with lived experience with disabilities and chronic health conditions, I think that's important to actually say that. Um, you specifically talked about substance use and mental illness, both of which we would consider disabilities, but we're not sure why you would want to limit it to those two populations. Certainly the deaf community is underrepresented in healthcare having people that, that um, are able to communicate in American Sign Language is critically important. And when you think about cultural competence, I would think about disability competence. One of the things we've learned in this pandemic is our public health infrastructure doesn't have the disability competence that it needs. You probably saw the CDC director got in uh, hot water uh, about a week and a half ago because of the way she talked about people with disabilities dying during the pandemic. So I, don't, I may be misinterpreting what you mean by people with lived experience, but I think if you could define it a little bit more clearly, it would be helpful. Great feedback, Andy, thank you. Never meant to limit to just people with mental illness or substance abuse. I think that it is a great point to be had that people with any other types of physical disabilities or people with chronic conditions are also um, underrepresented and underemployed, uh, even though they're individuals who are incredibly interested in being a part of the workforce. And so how we can, uh, would love to discuss further and how we can better engage with, with those communities to ensure that they're included. And we'll definitely make that more clear in our language. Thanks. Thank you. Sarita. Hi, good morning. Uh, thanks. This is a really, I, I, I concur. This is really exciting. I appreciate kind of the, the, think, the thinking, the strategy at, at these uh, critical workforce challenges. Um, and I guess the question for, for uh, you all is um, a little bit more about, you know, how will these new workforce programs uh, kind of be evaluated for success? And, you know, examples like, you know, can you speak, for example, like you mentioned the um, you know, obviously the dire um, workforce or labor shortages we're facing. Do we have any um, information or projections on those more specifically? And, you know, kind of based on those, are we seeing, are there any kind of targets that we're seeking to achieve in particular direct workforce areas? Um, so I just maybe a little bit more clarity on, 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 how, on evaluation and are there particular targets? Yeah, no, I think the, those are really good questions. Um, so the HCI, HCAI, the, the Department of Healthcare Access and Information, we really um, uh, changed the name to uh, reflect some of the work on workforce. And we're really looking to consolidate some of our uh, thought leadership uh, with regards to workforce development within that department. And one of the aspects of that really is looking at um, the robust, <coughs> excuse me, the robustness of our evaluations around some of our programs. Uh, this is particularly the case with regards to scholarship or loan repayment programs in particular. Are people, you know, some of the questions, are people actually staying in rural parts of the state, serving underserved populations, et cetera, and really thinking about what additional behavior changes can we drive towards with particular incentives to get people to fill in the gaps. And so that's going to be some of the work there. We're also partnering up with some academic institutions to really think about the supply and demand 
and to better understand the supply and demand over the course of the next couple of years uh, to drive towards being able to set some concrete metrics to say this is where we need to be as a state with regards to some of the components that Darcy alluded to. But that's just kind of some of the initial thinking around ways in which we're looking to wrap ourselves around the, the issue around evaluation and, and specific metrics related to what we're trying to achieve here. Darcy, I don't know if you want to fill in the gaps there as well. Uh, no, but I know that we have a lot of really smart researchers on this call. And if there are any uh, ideas about linking to kind of secondary um, outcomes related to related to health measures, we'd love to have those discussions because, um, right, we know we know that at the end of the day, that's one of the most important metrics for us as a state. And uh, so, any ideas about that would would love to discuss. I'm going to do a quick time check. We have, um, it looks like three questions. I don't want to rush this conversation. Um, and I want to hear from our advisors. So I see Kieran, Nancy, and Elizabeth have questions. Um, if we could get, um, if we could allow Marco and Darcy to stay until 10, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, happy to. Nancy. Thank you. Really appreciating the opportunity with the budget and particularly the comments of my colleagues on this phone about things that are also important in addition to what's been mentioned. I do think though, as we're looking at expanding the scope and reach of a strained workforce, something that doesn't require a financial infusion, but certainly requires some political muscle at the state leadership level is support for advanced practice nurses practicing to the full scope of their education and would really like to see that as um, a priority. It's, a, it's something that we wrestle with each year and there really is no reason to be doing that when other states have really taken this on and made it happen. So a plug for that. Thank you for that, appreciate it. Elizabeth? Yes, hi everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And I wanna um, also say, Nancy, I completely agree with you about that in terms of dementia care, how valuable advanced practice nurses are. But most of I was really excited to see the investment in workforce because of course families living with dementia across the state have really been struggling even before the pandemic. And with the pandemic, it's been a nightmare uh, for folks. One thing we haven't talked as much about is the community health workers. And I'm, I was excited to see that because the possibilities for engaging community health workers in dementia and, and helping caregivers and helping around issues related to aging are very exciting. Um, kind of related to Kevin's comment, uh, I'm wondering how much of this investment would go towards aging and dementia, it, it seems like a big bucket. And I don't know if you have thoughts on, on that piece of it. Just something to think about, I guess. Yeah, so we're still working through the kind of the, uh, the details. I think part of it is, is engagement with stakeholders over the course of the next couple of weeks and months as we uh, continue to have the conversation with our legislative colleagues too, to really lock this down. And obviously this is just a proposal and the legislature ultimately has to act on that proposal and, and put it in the budget. But I think that we are looking for ultimate feedback from folks around what, what would be the right um, makeup of, of way, way, ways in which we prioritize these dollars. So I think that, you know, a call to all of you collectively and something to even consider as a group, as an impact group, is to say, look, here are the things that we would recommend you all lean in on. So we would welcome that type of feedback from all of you as a group or individually as organizations uh, to let us know, like, this, this is kind of how we would recommend you prioritize these buckets of dollars with regards to workforce. And that's true for all of the budget proposals that are in the governor's uh, budget. I mean, I think that we would look to feedback from all of you, and this is an iterative process. We put something out so that people can react to it. And now is the time where we roll up our sleeves and work with our legislative colleagues to try to kind of figure out how to get it to as close to perfect as we possibly can. So I think, Elizabeth, we welcome the feedback that you all can put on paper and send to us. And we would encourage this group as a whole to do that as well. Karen? 
Yeah, thanks, Marco and Darcy, for providing us with all this information. I'll say we're incredibly excited about this budget and a lot of good things in it. Workforce, I'd say not specific to the older adult population, but ending our um, exclusions for Medi-Cal on the basis of immigration status. Um, but on that subject of coverage and specific to older adults, you know, last year we were very grateful that you did the expansion of Medi-Cal for older adults, regardless of immigration status. And I'm wondering if there's any thought given to making investments in outreach to that population. I think we have a concern that that population is going to be, um, need particularly intensive outreach, culturally and linguistically appropriate outreach in order to become enrolled in coverage when we open that. So that's one question on coverage. And the second question on coverage is um, just recognizing that while the Medi-Cal expansions are definitely the most important thing we can do, we still have folks who are gonna be slightly above that Medi-Cal income threshold, but not eligible for covered California due to immigration status, and particularly concerned about our older adults who fall into that category, uh, for whom no form of coverage is accessible or affordable right now, but um, desperately need it. And so wondering if there's any thought given to working with the federal government to end those covered California exclusions as well, so that we really can make sure that all of our older adults, regardless of immigration status, have access to health coverage. Yeah, I know. Uh, thanks for both of your questions. So on the first piece, we don't have dollars in the budget specifically for outreach and, and marketing and communication, but I think it's something that we're looking at because I think we see the we definitely see the 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 need for that. Um, and organizations like yours and others have kind of elevated the need for something to that effect. I mean, the reason why Covered California is uh, so successful is that it has the ability to do that significant outreach. And we believe that this population, both the older adults that will be getting access, uh, as well as those individuals that we're expanding access, Medicaid access to over the course of the next couple of years, uh, the in-reach and, and need to make sure that it's both culturally competent and linguistically competent is gonna be really important. So we recognize that. We also know that there's a hole in the budget with regards to that. And we're working on trying to figure out how we rectify something to that effect. On the, the last question with regards to what I call the forgotten middle, those individuals that are really teetering on the brink of becoming Medicaid eligible, but not being Medicaid eligible. I think those are kind of continuing things we continue to look at. Uh, and it's something that is um, something that we have ongoing conversations about nothing right now that I can share with regards to like us really being able to lean in on something like that. But we see that piece as, as kind of an additional next step with regards to kind of where we look at um, filling the holes with regards to the coverage gaps. I think we've made some tremendous progress over the course of the last couple of years, but I think there's certainly more to be done in the space. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, again, thank you all so much. I'll turn it over to Susan. I think this is great feedback. I think a lot for us to kind of work on and iterate on. And I think I appreciate the honest conversation with regards to what more we can do. I think uh, there's always more we can do and more for us to improve on. And we look forward to doing that with you all. So I'll turn it back over to Susan. Thank you, Marco. And thank you, Darcy. And being you know new to state, government and this being the first budget cycle i want to thank both of you for your um exceptional work on the january 10th budget and the hundreds of hours that you logged to um, put these proposals together so thank you for your work leading up to the budget and the work to come um, through the budget process and thanks for spending time with us here this morning appreciate you both very much and with that we'll give um we'll invite kim if she's with us to um, get us back on track to Good the morning. opening remarks. Great, we Good hear you, morning. Kim. Oh, wonderful. Let me just begin with a very brief moment, but heartfelt of gratitude. Uh, thank you so much to, as always, the Master Plan for Aging team for the, well, today additional tech support, but the culture of uh, being nimble and collaborative. And I actually think it's gonna be um, my remarks following on uh, yours and, uh, the agency leadership, which I was so happy to hear, will be uh, fit right in. Briefly, I did want to offer some perspective from this new position in the governor's office. Um, 
most of what I would say, I think I, um, Marco, of course, uh, said it so brilliantly, but let me just highlight a couple themes that are coming out from the governor's office. First is uh, the implementation theme. Last year was historic, and I think we can be all proud that the framework for the home and care system, home and community care system, was established. I increasingly lean on the uh, Master Plan for Aging uh, subcommittee report and the four corners that were laid out, whether it's the services with the historic investments from CalAIM and HCBS, the workforce, which is again invested this year, affordability with the Medicaid expansions, both on status and assets, and navigation with the biggest investments ever in taking our ADRC system statewide. So all four corners were, were invested in last year and it's just getting started. Uh, and you see more of that in workforce this year, but I'm, I'm really excited by the conversation that was just had about how do we make that real and connect the dots and have those outcomes. The implementation, kind of the two year lens of last year's comeback plan and this year's blueprint plan is a major focus of this administration. How do these two year budgets work together to drive transformative change? A second major theme is inclusion. Everything the governor is tackling, as he says, the existential threats to our state, whether it's housing or climate, are we centering and including older adults, people with disabilities and families? So you see things like the climate plan, including older adults, um, risks from extreme heat, and you see proposals like food for all, uh, broadening food access to all older adults, regardless of immigration status. So inclusion is a theme that we wanna do more on, on both the aging and disability side and welcome the continued partnership with the groups from aging and disability and Alzheimer's I've been able to meet with so far. And a third theme I do wanna lift up is as you all have rightly said, there are still new opportunities this year. And one I just wanna to have to mention is there is one area of aging policy that is squarely in front of the legislature and the governor this year and that is nursing home financing. And we would very much like to hear from the impact committee and your members um, with your recommendations for how California can take the lessons of COVID uh, and the lessons of pre-COVID and build back this important part of our care continuum better. Uh, it doesn't take anything away from our focus on home and community care to wanna to make sure that nursing home care where provided is quality uh, and it's advancing our health equity vision as well. So I, I do hope we can follow up as well on that major once every five year opportunity. But really, I think this conversation demonstrated the most important point that I wanted to make sure we all uh, um, heard and shared, which is momentum, momentum. We really do want this year to be kind of just another uh, stepping stone forward and invest in all of those corners of the home care framework, if you will, uh, bring the Elder Justice Council to life, uh, nine of the 10 Alzheimer's recommendations funded and proposed to be funded. So um, it's a lot of momentum, but that momentum will only turn into meaningful change with the kind of engagement that was just modeled here today and that will happen uh, following up on this. So please continue to do the follow-up that you heard from our agency leadership on how to make those workforce investments specific to older and disabled adults. Uh, let me uh, help follow up on inclusion across all cabinet and across all government. Uh, this again is an all of government plan. Um, with and in support of HHS leadership. And uh, again, don't miss the opportunity on nursing homes. So with that, I do want to let, I uh, hope that's 10 o'clock, Susan, there you go, right back on time to do that deep dive into workforce goal four and help us get that right. Thanks. Great, Kim, thank you so much for being here today um, and for sharing your perspective. Um, so we're now, um, the reason we chose in consultation with the impact committee, you know, we, we talked about what to focus today's agenda on, and I'm, I'm thrilled that we're talking about workforce and, you know, Kevin, when you mentioned earlier about building capacity and infrastructure, the workforce is part of our HCBS capacity and infrastructure. So we're going to spend a bit of time. We're going to alter the agenda here. Um, I think we'll spend about 15 minutes. Um, combined, um, talking about initiatives that are in play. Um, we want to be sure that we spend time talking about the MPA anniversary and next steps for the year. And we absolutely want to spend time as a committee talking about the role of this group and how you can work together and be most useful um, between meetings and at meetings. So we don't want to shortchange that conversation. 
So we'll go ahead and get started now with um, a quick overview. Um, for those of you, um, we're just highlighting goal four, caregiving that works in the master plan. And as you heard mention, the LTSS subcommittee report also had extensive um, recommendations around the workforce. So this is um, the focus of our conversation here today, um, talking about um, good caregiving jobs creation. Next slide. And to remind you of several of the current year initiatives, we're in we're in midway through two years of initiatives. So here are three specifically, and I think the next slide shares additional. Oh nope, going back. Sorry about that. The three that we're focusing on. Um, you heard Darcy mention that the HKI that there will be a formal process that will serve as a direct care workforce solutions table. Um, so we're going to talk about these initiatives today and what's underway. And next slide. I think we could spend eight hours today talking about workforce. It, there's never been as much investment activity. Um, we're talking about over $2 billion in play between the current year budget, the HCBS spending plan, and what was just proposed last week by the governor. So to, to keep expectations in check, we will, we will leave you wanting more today. So I urge all of you to participate in the webinar that we have scheduled for February 1st and to share that with your team. Um, each department will be reporting out on current year investments. So you'll get um, greater detail on all of the things that, that we're talking about today. Uh, next slide. And when I say all of the departments that will be reporting out, this is a joint effort, as you've heard, uh, of two agencies and multiple departments. So each of us will be represented on that February 1st webinar. So you'll get a, com a composite picture of everything that's going on. Next slide. And just an example of just in the Health and Human Services Agency alone, um, nearly a billion dollars of current investments that are um, playing out in these departments and others. So this is just a, a teaser for some of the topics that will be discussed on the February 1st webinar. And next slide. And so now uh, many of you worked with Julia as part of the uh, master plan, the LTSS subcommittee um, work group, and we're delighted to have Julia join us today to give a, an overview from the Labor and Workforce Development Agency. Julia, take it away. Hey. And you're on mute. You're on mute, Julia. Sorry about that. Good morning, everybody. Um, so uh, as many of you have heard uh, Abby say's name mentioned, she's our Deputy Secretary for the Future of Work, and she's been instrumental in elevating the direct care workforce investments and efforts and our partnership with HHS, and she was unable, unfortunately, to be here due to a conflict, so I'll be presenting on behalf of the agency. I'm really pleased to be with you today to share the agency's important initiatives and investments that are geared toward realizing goal four of the MPA, uh, and specifically strategy B, creating good care caregiving jobs. I want to highlight the operative qualifying word in strategy B, good jobs. The master plan is having a little bit difficulty hearing. I'm not sure if other people are experiencing that. Okay. Can you all hear me okay? That is better. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think maybe I'm just sitting a little bit too far from the speaker. Let me try that again. All right. So um, I wanted to highlight the operative qualifying word in strategy B, which is good jobs. The master plan's emphasis on creating quality, family-sustaining jobs for direct care workers reflects the labor agency's priorities as well. We know we are facing a huge and ever-growing shortage of direct care workers, up to 3.2 million by 2030. We also know that in order to bridge that gap, both attract and retain workers and provide quality care, we need to raise the floor, increase wages, improve working conditions, and provide accessible training opportunities. Um, next slide, please. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to read this entire mission statement. This is a broader vision statement for our agency in general. I'd like to highlight some of the 
um, tools we use to build for family sustaining jobs, which are the high road training partnerships, which I mentioned earlier, also pre apprenticeship, apprenticeship and high quality earn and learn programs in partnership with our higher education network and workforce systems in the state with an emphasis toward including historically marginalized communities. Um, specifically, developing culturally responsive, competency-based, accessible training for long-term care workers, the majority of whom are women of color, coupled with increased wages and improved job quality, is essential to providing optimal support and dignified care for older and disabled adults, and is crucial to California's equitable economic recovery. Next slide, please. So uh, Assistant Secretary Delgado has already summarized some of the exciting investments proposed for the coming year, and I'll touch on those in a moment. First, I'd like to share some of our current initiatives related to the direct care workforce and how they relate to goal four of the MPA. First is our partnership between um, the labor agency and CDA and HHS more broadly. The Master Plan for Aging and the Future of Work Commission report, both issued in the last year, both elevate the direct care workforce as an essential building block for improving quality of and access to care and for the state's economic recovery, highlighting our agency's shared priorities. Initiated by former Director McCoy Wade and now under Director Damaris's leadership, CDA has brought together the Labor Agency and all of the departments, which Susan just listed for you, um, under um, HHS that deal with the direct care workforce in any way to learn about each other's work so that we may coordinate and leverage resources and expertise to better serve direct care workers and consumers. The convening of this internal working group is really laying the foundation for the direct care workforce solutions table envisioned by MPA Initiative 111. Our first project, as Susan mentioned, has been to catalog all current investments for um, the current fiscal year, and that information will present at the February 1 webinar. Next slide, please. Um, in addition, there are specific investments in the current fiscal year um, in um, high road training partnerships, um, which were uh, described briefly earlier. There is a $100 million investment that will be out for solicitation in early spring in the next couple of months. Uh, there is one current high road training partnership in partnership with SEIU 2015's Center for um, Caregiver Advancement that is specifically for training CNAs and IHSS providers to be first responders or to include first, respond, um, first responder training um, in their broader training. Um, there's also 14.5 million um, invested in certified nursing assistant training, CNA training through our workforce development board and that is intended, that will also be out of solicitation sooner even um, than the HRTC funding. Um, and that's intended to expand the current CNA apprenticeship program, which is also in partnership with um, the Center for Caregiver Investment um, and relatively small currently, um, and to develop a new CNA to LVN apprenticeship pathway. Next slide, please. Um, now for the coming uh, fiscal year 22 to 23, um, this is an overview of our agency's investments. I'll be focusing on healthcare and immigrant um, workforce. Uh, direct care jobs are a growing and vital piece of our state's healthcare puzzle. And while immigrants are 30% of California's total workforce, they comprise well over half of the direct care workforce. Next slide, please. So while um, HHS and the Labor Agency will work closely together on all aspects of the health care um, workforce initiative described previously. Specific investments at um, Labor Agency will support um, the um, Workforce Council for Healthcare Training, which was um, um, referenced earlier. Uh, and we are hoping, as um, you know, in response to some of the questions that came earlier, that, that um, this council will evolve to include um, the goals. Um, of the direct care workforce solutions table. An additional 90 million um, for the healthcare workforce advancement fund, um, which will um, be implemented under the employment training plant panel, which is an arm of the, um, the labor agency to support job entry and career advancement. So um, just for a little background there, um, the e uh, employment training panel or ETP provides funding to employers to assist in upgrading the skills of their workers. The ETP funds, they're not a training agency. Um, generally businesses determine their own training needs and how to provide training. In this particular program, um, the idea is that the funding may go directly to employers with requirements for wage increases after completing training or to unions, community-based organizations or specific trade training organizations. 
So an additional 340 million as referenced earlier to the high road training partnerships. Um, likewise, um, in, for this funding stream, the idea would be that um, it would support collaborations and training programs among community-based organizations, local workforce boards, unions, and educational institutions. And um, uh, I should have pointed out earlier that the circles there with the numbers are meant to reference the different initiatives under um, goal four um, of the MPA. So um, for all of these, um, 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 for the Healthcare Workforce Advancement Fund and the high road training partnerships, Obviously, the idea is to diversify and expand the pipeline for these direct care workforce jobs. Next slide, please. Um, these next three investments also serve to diversify the workforce pipeline and um, uh, fall under the sort of immigrant workforce bucket. Um, English language learners health careers um, initiative through la the labor agency is meant to support integrated education and training, vocational English and bridge programs for English language learners at multiple language levels. An additional 30 million is proposed to be invested to expand the current English language learner pilots under our Employment Development Department's Workforce Services Branch to accelerate integrated education and training for English language learners not in the workforce. This is, as I said, an expansion um, with the hope of moving to 15 sites across the state. Another 20 million is proposed to be invested in our workforce literacy program under the employment training panel um, for employers to expand workplace literacy training in contextualized English, digital and technical skills for incumbent workers. Now these last two are not specific um, to um, health career or direct care workforce, but will be inclusive of those, um, of those workers. So in conclusion, guaranteeing a living wage for direct care workers in California would create an economic multiplier effect, increasing productivity and workforce participation, generating by 2030 additional economic output upwards of 3.6 billion public assistance savings of 165 million and over 50,000 direct care jobs alone. Research has also shown that accessible, culturally and linguistically responsive caregiver training improves the quality of care, reducing urgent medical intervention and thus costs. These new pathways for workers will not only strengthen health outcomes in our communities, but also strengthen the direct care workforce as an economic driver for low-income communities and an equity driver for the whole state. Thank you. Julia, thank you so much. And thank you for your outstanding work and your fabulous partnership. And to this, please extend our thanks to the secretary as well. Um, we'll be working arm in arm linked in the year ahead. Um, I also wanted to, um, we, want, we invited um, one of our impact committee members, a uh, state and national, maybe even international leader. Um, Doug Moore served um, on the governor's Alzheimer's Prevention and Preparedness Task Force and um, was very well represented on the Master Plan for Aging as well as um, the LTSS subcommittee. And um, we wanna make sure that we are person-centered in this conversation and I think Doug, brings um, the perspective of the workers that we're describing um, when we talk about workforce investment. So Doug, if you'd like to share a few thoughts with us. Good morning. Uh, good morning and it's good to be with you today. Our union, UDW, is proud to take part in the Master Plan for Aging. We represent over 120,000, 25,000 workers who provide care through the in-home support services program. This is the front line of the long-term care crisis. That's sorry, we may have lost you. We may have lost okay. you. Uh, um, UDW represents over. You can't hear me? Oh, no. You're back, Doug. We might have just okay. lost connection for a second. Okay. Okay. Uh, as I was saying, UDW represents over 125,000 um, workers who provide care through the in home support services system. This is the front line of the long term care crisis. Many IHSS recipients are seniors who have spent down their family savings. 
They are being cared for by a spouse or a son or daughter who has left the workforce and will have no family savings after the recipient passes. And they are making minimum wage or just over. These financial disasters happening to families will impact generations and have wide reaching implications. One of our members in San Diego, a woman named Susan, sold her house and spent her savings to take care of her husband when he got a rare form of dementia. As she watched him near the end of his disease, she realized she would be alone with no money and not even 60 years old. Looking at that impending scenario, Susan said, I've been waiting for, the, for this ball to drop for 10 years. I've done everything right, but now I'm gonna be broke. The problem is even more ominous in black and brown communities. If you consider that African-Americans have doubled the risk of Alzheimer's and dementia as white people and that black families lost half their wealth in the housing crisis, you can't help but surmise that the increasing need for long-term care is going to exacerbate economic and racial inequality. We know that we are in an unprecedented care crisis. There are not enough professional caregivers to meet the needs of seniors and people with disabilities in California. Estimates are that we will need 200 to 500,000 more caregivers, caregivers just to meet the need of our current population, not to mention the Californians of the future. So let me tell you about the changes we urgently want to make to address the care crisis. First, we must raise caregiver wages. Wages in the direct care industry are the lowest of any profession. And that's a matter of gender and racial justice. Direct care work is larger the work of women of color. We have to act boldly to raise wages to at least $24 an hour. And with health care, paid time off, and retirement. We have to address access to care. We need affordable access to LTSS for all Californians. We can create an economy of scale where everyone pays into an LTSS system like the one in Washington state. With an expanded LTSS options for consumers, we can expand the job opportunities and quality of direct care workers. And as we will discuss today, development to care workers. Direct care is a career and direct care workers are professionals. Let's treat them as such with meaningful training, especially on caring for those with cognitive impairments. We need to we need a care career ladder to overcome workforce shortages and reduce turnover. California's long-term care system relies on the heroic efforts of long-term care providers. The attention we give to this workforce is the bedrock that the rest of our recommendations rely on. I look forward to our continued conversations with you today and beyond. Thank you. Doug, thank you so much for those words. Thank you. And you reinforce that the, the long-term services and support system that is envisioned in the master plan starts at home um, with home care workers. Um, so thank you very much. At this point, I think we can take up to 10 minutes if there's something that um, was shared um, by Julia or Doug that you'd like to talk about on current initiatives please do so now. It'll take us till 1030. If, if you feel that the topic was covered adequately with Marco and Darcy, we can um, move on to um, the data dashboard update. Are there any questions at this point? Comments? All right, so I think everybody signed up for the webinar. <laughs> and knows that on February 1st, you can have even, you know, you'll hear even more on this topic. And so making sure there aren't any other questions that I missed. All right, Julia and Doug, thank you both. And now I'd like to turn it over to Terry Shaw. Um, welcome, Terry. Hi, thank you. I'm so happy to be here and with you all. I'll keep my comments brief because I know there's still a long agenda ahead of us and I want to make sure everybody has time. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. 
I'll be giving you some updates about the data dashboard. We have a number of updates that are pending, meaning they should be live uh, by the end of this week to coincide with our anniversary events. And I'm not gonna go through all of the individual indicators that will be updated there, but you can see there's there are about seven of them crossing most of the goals of the plan. Um, and that we also will be adding in data on um, sexual orientation and gender identity. If we move to the next slide, you can see an example of what that um, addition of the SOGI data will look like. This one happens to be about community support, um, um, meaning people who say that people in their neighborhood are willing to help each other. And so you can see how the data is broken down um, in a variety of ways around um, sexual orientation and gender identity. So we're excited to be able to begin to add data on um, SOGI where it is available. So that's uh, one improvement that we are about to launch. Let's move to the next slide. We also have a number of additional improvements that we are working on for the upcoming um, quarters uh, later in the next few months. Um, one is that we are looking to um, add data on disability status. So in much the same way that we have um, data available for um, sexual orientation and gender identity, we are looking to be able to provide um, uh, breakdowns of various data points based on disability status as well. So we're meeting with some um, key advisors, including some folks on this uh, impact committee to be able to figure out the best way to present that data given the data that's available. We will also be adding important up, uh, indicators um, central to some of what we've been talking about here today around um, LTSS and caregiving and also um, some new indicators around unintentional falls and homelessness, as well as updating indicators around facility complaints, primary care shortage areas, life expectancy, suicide, aid, and ADRC um, to reflect the growing um, scope of that uh, set of services. Next slide. Most importantly, I wanted to take this opportunity to be able to share with you all a key next step that we are working on that will undergird not only, of course, the data dashboard, but all of the work that we are doing on the master plan and consistent with many of the comments we've heard today around the importance of evaluation and, and, and evidence-based um, policymaking. So um, we are on the cusp of announcing in spring of this year, a research partnership uh, which, of course, is pursuant to MPA Initiative 102. And the purpose of that research partnership will include providing recommendations for indicators and data sources for the data dashboard for aging. So uh, key to improving the dashboard over time, as we've always sought to do, um, but also to inform master plan uh, overall. Um, this Research partnership will, of course, build on the work of the MPA research subcommittee and the recommendations that they had, which included a research partnership. Um, we will also be engaging the um, Cal HHS Center for Data Insights and Innovation in this discussion in an effort to ensure that this research partnership not only informs the master plan and uh, across all aging initiatives uh, um, as much as possible, but is also a model for how the research community can be engaged in and um, helping to inform policymaking um, on uh, issues beyond aging. So um, really appreciate everyone's patience as we've been developing this initiative and very excited to be moving forward with all of you to get this set up. And that's all I have for Great. today. Great. Terry, thank you. And um, Terry's been just an outstanding thought partner and leader of our research activities, and it would not be possible without the support of the foundations that um, have enabled us to consult with Terry throughout. Um, and it just keeps getting deeper and strong, deeper, wider and stronger, this partnership under your leadership, Terry. Thank you so much. Um, are there any questions for Terry about the research partnership? And while I'm looking, um, our new deputy, de our new deputy director, Sarah Steenhausen, heads up policy, research, and equity. So research, uh, this partnership will fall under um, Sarah's portfolio when she's up and running. 
I don't see any questions from the group. If I missed you, just take yourself off mute and interrupt. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and move to the hardest working person in state government, <laughs> Amanda Lawrence. Amanda, let's hear where we are as we approach the one year, well, we're past the one year anniversary as we approach the celebration of our one year anniversary. Yes, I am so excited um, to share the work that is coming up for um, the Master Plan for Aging. So go ahead and share the next slide. We have, I think as we've mentioned on Friday, um, this Friday, our MPA First Anniversary Summit. And um, we will be releasing our first annual progress report. You know, we released a mid-year report in July. This is a much more formal report. Um, we will you know, be releasing it any day now. Um, we'll share it via social media. We'll share it in our newsletter and we'll post it to the MPA webpage when it's ready. And this report will cover updates on those initiatives that are throughout each and every one of the five bold goals for building an age in California by 2030. Next slide. And that event. So I hope everyone has already registered. I will go ahead and pop into the chat, the registration link um, for the event. And on the next slide, we'll go over um, who is actually confirmed to speak. We'll have um, a welcome by the governor. And we'll be joined by Kim and Richard Figueroa from the governor's office. We'll have several stakeholders present at this um, event. We'll really, the purpose is to celebrate what we've accomplished thus far, but to really set the stage for what we intend to do over the next few years to continue to build on the success of the master plan for aging. Next slide. And then we will kick off together we engage 2022. Um, once again, we will really be focused on listening to um, our stakeholders and the public. We want to hear more about how you feel about the master plan for aging, what you think the next priority should be, how do we how do we leverage what we've already accomplished, leverage what's in the budget already, and really advance these initiatives and strategies within the master plan. So we'll have a series of events throughout the rest of 2022. We have, as we just mentioned, that direct care workforce webinar um, in a couple weeks. And then we'll be relaunching our Wednesday webinar series. Those will be on the first Wednesdays at 10 o'clock of each month. And they will, um, we'll cover a slew of topics. I'll show you that on the next slide. We're also gonna go ahead and do some regional town halls, some legislative roundtables. We wanna get it all over California, you know, maybe, Susan and I and stakeholders can get out and see each other in, in, in real life, in person, and have some really great conversations about what's happening on the ground and how we can really make an impact in people's lives. All of this work is gonna be uh, supported by a communications firm, um, really gonna focus on um, stakeholder outreach, this engagement experience. We wanna tell the story of the master plan. We wanna share what it means to people, what these policies mean to people. Um, and how it's going to change over the next you know, eight, nine years. So really our goal here is to expand our engagement and circle of support and build a lot of local MPA planning and implementation. Next slide. And a lot of uh, information on here. Um, you can go ahead and read through all of these, but these are the topics we're focusing on. Uh, you can see, you know, June is Alzheimer's or Dementia Awareness Month, and so we'll have Alzheimer's and dementia in focus. Um, we will be focusing on that no wrong door system, climate change and emergency preparedness going hand in hand, and really a lot of best practices. So we are going to have, um, just like the last webinar Wednesday, a few speakers for each webinar to really share best practices and share what we are doing and gain recommendations and information to move this plan forward. So that'll go all the way through December. Um, and we will have, and our, really our first webinar Wednesday is going to be um, the celebration or a review of the MPA SACS LTSS subcommittees report. Um, so we'll review some of those recommendations. Next slide. And I'm going to go ahead and hand it back to Susan. If you have any questions about the events, if you want to be involved or have ideas, email me, please. Um, we really want to make sure that we engage all of our, our stakeholders in that process. Go ahead, Susan. Thank you so much, Amanda. And we hope to see all of you. I know several of you are presenters on Friday. So we look forward to seeing you once again at the end of this week. Um, 
So this, this is the point in the agenda where um, we really want to hear from the impact committee members. Uh, we've got about, let's say we've got 15 minutes here. This is the third meeting of the impact stakeholder committee. Um, you've now, other than Elizabeth, you've each had a couple rotations to see you know, how things are going. Your charge and charter is very simple. It's to advise the administration on implementation of the master plan for aging. And I think we're at a critical juncture here in terms of how we use your time going forward, um, what you're able to give in terms of time. And as we start year two of the master plan for aging, um, we would love to hear your thoughts on the support that you need. And I can share um, what I think is is very helpful going forward in the year ahead. And Kevin touched on it a bit in his opening remarks. Um, I think we're at a, we are at a place where we have, we're mid-year through two years of initiatives. We're at the, the very beginning of a 10 year blueprint for our state. We're implementing um, legislative and budget initiatives from prior years. We're embarking on CalAIM. Um, so we're at a, we're at a point um, where I think this group could be very helpful in looking forward, helping the administration to look forward at what's next on the horizon, whether that's the May revise, whether that's the next two years of initiatives. Um, Amanda and I are reviewing the one-year progress report and it's 50 pages long. That's how much activity, there's not a shortage of activity um, happening in this area. And I think this group can be invaluable uh, by pointing towards one, two, three uh, major themes, initiatives or activities um, taking this huge body of work, uh, the budget that was just released last week and, and pushing towards, um, you know, pushing in a direction going forward instead of serving as a look behind or a look back. Um, we don't have the progress report to share with you today, but I think when you see it later this week, um, it's a very good accounting of what has happened to date. And I think um, you're all positioned well as individuals, as leaders with your organizations, but also in your role as an impact committee me member to help help guide the administration um, in a few key areas. Kim mentioned um, nursing home reform is one example. You know, Kevin definitely hearing about HCBS and what are the next concrete steps towards the HCBS system we envision. So I will stop there and I wanna use this time to hear from all of you. And Fernando, you're the first hand that I saw. So I'm, I'll, I'll call on you. Thank, thank, thank you all. Uh, if, if I can maybe uh, go up to 30 or 40,000 feet. Uh, first of all, we have so much to feel good about both the uh, progress on the specific goals, the budgetary investments over the last two years, Certainly there's more targeting and I think Kevin and others have talked about that to ensure that aging disability continues to be at the forefront. But uh, as we come up on uh, this year, 2022, and uh, what I call the politics of aging, the midterm elections, uh, one of the things that I feel good about this whole process is how we've changed the narrative. It's not just about serving older persons, it's about equity, diversity, it's about persons with disabilities of all types, and it's about uh, encouraging younger populations to start thinking about their lifespan and how all this benefits them. So this is all to say, is there a way in this year to come up with a clear, impactful branding statement narrative where we can find a way to inform the public at large and the voters here in California that we're making a whole new uh, sea change in how we view longevity in the state of California, both because we have a lot to brag about nationally. I think California has been the most innovative, creative, and impactful in terms of 
putting in real dollars to invest in all these issues. But we're also a trendsetter in showing that ultimately it's about how we prepare for the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years when the country will be like California, older, more diverse, and need to invest in younger populations and persons with disabilities. So it's all about saying, can we think about in this year having a more focused, impactful, and if I can say even sexy agenda that informs the public and the electorate, hey folks, exciting things are happening that are gonna benefit all Californians and also be an example for the rest of the country. Uh, so, because we're doing so many great things, we may get a little lost in the weeds, very important weeds, as we move forward with the initial goals of the master plan. Thank you, Fernando. Um, yes, that, that is a, a great goal, and it's um, a goal that I think this committee can further. Um, Andy, let's hear from you. Yeah, I just want to strongly um, agree with my friend Fernando. You know, I, I'm excited, Susan, that you're uh, engaging a communications firm because I think they can help us think about how to distill why why do we have a master plan for aging? What what are the set of problems that we're trying to solve, and what are some of the most exciting approaches that we're taking to solve those problems? You know, Fernando, I feel like one of the challenges in the messaging with California is that we do have great leadership you know, arguably the best state leadership in the country on these issues, um, but we don't have great outcomes. So I feel like as we as we talk about what we're doing in California, it's important that it's not just cheering ourselves, but it's also having the sense of urgency that our outcomes are not where they need to be. And those outcomes affect everyone in California, which is what I think I heard Fernando saying. When we talk about aging, we need everybody in California to think we're talking about them. So I'm hoping whatever messaging we come up with, people will understand that they have a stake in what we're doing. Thank you, Andy. Leandra. Hi, everyone. I promise, I uh, I apologize for being off, off camera. I have kids that are home due to COVID stuff. So um, grateful to be here and really hardened by the conversation, the um, way that we've highlighted different ways that the administration has really focused on um, supporting and funding different aspects of the workforce. And I think there's an opportunity to, in our meetings and, you know, with the uh, communications and PR work that's going to be happening to really link everything together. I think even for those of us that are at this level and working in advocacy and with state government, you know, there's so many different provisions within the budget um, for different workforce sectors that can relate to older adults. And I think that one of the things we can do is bring things together because for us, it's, it's, it's a bit overwhelming. And so for the average um, consumer or, um, you know, member of the public, it could probably be um, really um, difficult to track everything and understand how everything really drills down and impacts them at a day, on a day-to-day -day basis. So really thinking about more of a, a public um, awareness campaign around health, all of the different funding, particularly around workforce, will kind of, you know, come together and impact somebody who's either experiencing, you know, a crisis or, um, you know, someone who's a caregiver, um, so that it's really plain and simple. Thank you. Linking together. Other thoughts from impact committee members? Not seeing anybody volunteering. What about this notion about the this group being used um, to scope the work ahead instead of um, looking behind at the work that's happened, a deficit that I realize is because we no longer have the Master Plan for Aging Stakeholder Advisory Committee dedicated solely to this work. Um, there's not a, we, we're, we're so fortunate to have a number of stakeholder groups and bodies adopting pieces of the work, but this impact committee um, owns the whole. Um, and so the master plan stakeholder group was, you know, pushing forward, pushing forward, and you know, 
let's hear your thoughts on your oversight role, implementation, what implement, implementation means as a member of this committee. Andy? Yeah, I don't want to talk too much, but since other people aren't raising their hands, um, you know, I, I, I agree, Susan, with the goal of trying to look forward and not look backward. I think one of the risks for us is that there were, you know, so many recommendations in the master plan for aging, as Fernando talked about, it's easy to kind of get lost in the weeds. And I think if we can look at the budget, think about the May revise, you know, as a short term, and then think about the next two years, you know, as a kind of an intermediate term, and then the governor's second term as governor, if he gets reelected as a as a broader next phase, and think about okay, how do we build on what we've done, and and kind of what are the priorities in the short, medium, and long term? That feels like a good a good task for this committee. Oh, Nancy, please. Sorry to miss a few minutes of the conversation. I will be going back and listening to the recording. Uh, but your, to your question, Susan, um, I don't think it's either or. Um, I think that there needs to be a focus on results and outcomes, as well as um, a forward look. So I think um, I would feel remiss if we weren't looking at outcomes because there was so much in the MPA that I think needs attention and it's certainly getting attention from your organization and the state as a whole. But I think um, representing um, folks in the state, I think that we, we do need to have an eye toward accountability as well as a vision for going forward. And seeing Karen's comment in the chat, um, the two-pronged, um, just as you said, um, evaluation and future planning. And looking at our timeline, is it possible that this, I believe the next meeting of this group is April. So if, if this group were able to look at the proposed, oh, go ahead, Kevin and Sarita. Serena was first this time, so I'm gonna let her go first. Okay, I'll I'll be brief. No, I just wanted to um I wanted to dovetail on off of uh, Nancy's comment. I think this um our our responsibility or is looking at the kind of the accountability structure frameworks. I think one thing you know we've talked about is you know the the um the partnerships, the cross agency partnerships, and understanding who is kind of you know understanding who is on point for. The, these efforts that are outlined in the master plan and being able to track that and you know understand the the accountability structure, I would say that would be a, a I think an important role for us as an impact committee. Kevin, thank you. Yeah, and I would agree with others who, who said I think we need to do both um, the accountability as to what's happened as well as looking forward. I I also appreciate. Um, Susan, your emphasis on making sure we are looking forward because there isn't necessarily another place where that's happening right now. And I guess one thing that could potentially be helpful is structuring these meetings so that there is an opportunity for us not just to hear from the state and then ask questions, but maybe to hear from the state as to what's happening and then also have opportunities to present recommendations, either from impact committee members or the committee together or from other committees that are have you know that that are part of the master plan for aging or other stakeholders to kind of say okay here's a report from the state of how it's going here's a perspective from someone else about what our next step should be and, and like I said sometimes that might be that the committee has the expertise of the perspective or has already heard from stakeholders and other spots it might be bringing in those stakeholders to create that environment to bring recommendations forward so I don't think we've done that as much yet effectively is to, to kind of make a recommendation. I think we've gotten some good information. We've had a chance to ask some good questions, but I think we probably need those recommendations, right? As to what the next two years look like, or even on accountability, some specific recommendations as to things that could be done differently or opportunities that could be leveraged better. So, I don't, so you know, is that kind of what you're thinking? Would that be helpful if there was some way that we were bringing recommendations into the space as well? 
Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, looking ahead to the April meeting, there is the one year progress report that you'll have visibility to coupled with the January budget. And I think linking the two um, and coming forward with some recommendations that, you know, um, elevate a few themes, issues, topics, April would be an excellent time for that. Um, and then it's also important to hear, um, you know, we'd wanna hear consensus of if the group agrees that the reports from the administration aren't as useful, we can pull back on those. And we would wanna hear, we would wanna follow your lead and not have it be seen as a backing away either, or that you're not accessing information that you need to make informed decisions. Uh, Elizabeth? Thanks, Susan. Um, and as the newcomer, let me just acknowledge that, that uh, I'm, I'm new to this group, so maybe that's a good thing uh, because I can comment on what, what, does, what would success look like. And it was very interesting just hearing all of the information today and then hearing Doug, uh, Doug sharing that story that you told about the, the caregiver who, who lost everything. And, uh, and we all see that, I think, people really struggling. Um, my comment is just to put this out there that it would be wonderful to see real life examples of the reach and the impact where possible to, to draw that line. And maybe that's what Fernando was alluding to too, almost like this vision, but even what does it look like if, if the master plan on aging really results in all the amazing work, what would that mean for someone living in rural California uh, who is dealing with a new diagnosis or frankly not diagnosed, which is more common um, and living with cognitive impairment or disabilities, what do they get that's different than what it was before? Um, and so I don't know if that's even possible for us to do, but as you were talking about yeah, a communications firm, so often the way that we communicate about the impact is through those stories in addition to the data. And so as an outsider, uh, that, that would be something that would really help make it come alive to the reach and the real impact of this group, which I know is what was a driving force in the beginning is to make a huge difference. Excellent. So we'll also wanna hear from you. Um, today was a two hour meeting. We are scheduled to meet quarterly. It feels a bit rushed. So if you um, think more needs to happen at the meetings or between meetings, um, please communicate that so that we can facilitate it. Um, was, were there any other committee members? Right. So would it work for the April meeting to flip the script a bit and invite the impact committee to bring to um, spend the bulk of the agenda um, providing feedback on the budget and the one year progress report um, and lifting up the work of DACLAC, Elder Justice, Alzheimer's, equity and we can facilitate that, you know, find a way to channel the highest level thinking from those other stakeholder groups and find an easy way to get that to you so that you don't have to chase it down. Would that approach work? Andy says, sounds good to me in the chat. Sarita, I like that suggested approach. Great, so we'd be stepping back a bit, looking holistically, but um, we would love to see a couple key, key themes, key recommendations, key issues um, as part of that conversation. Okay, great. And you have the full support of the CDA team to help you achieve that between now and April. Um, and with that, I wanna make sure we allow time for public comments. So Maria, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, 
Thank you, Susan. Um, and I and I just want to acknowledge as we turn to public comment that we had a little bit of a link issue. So we've got lots of Norberts joining us as attendees today. If you're able to change your name, and I, I'm not sure if we've uh, have that accommodation on Zoom for attendees, you hover over your name. It'll give you an option for more and then rename. Um, hopefully you're able to see that. And if not, we'll do our best to wade through it. Okay, and Nancy, if we could pull up the slides just so we have some instructions for public comment, that would be great. Thank you so much. Fantastic, just a couple of reminders, logistic reminders before we dive in. If you're joining us by phone, um, you can press star nine on your dial pad and that will uh, sort of virtually raise your hand in the meeting. We'll allow, uh, announce the last four digits of your phone number and we'll unmute your line for comments. Um, those who are joining by Zoom, maybe on your computer, laptop, uh, tablet, cell phone, um, you can use the raise hand button to join the queue for comment and we'll announce your name uh, and unmute your line. And of course, as always, you're welcome to uh, share your thoughts, comments, feedback using the Q&A icon and there will be, uh, it's at the bottom of your screen. So just pausing for a minute to see if anybody has public comments that they would like to share. Seeing none, maybe just a couple more seconds. And Susan, I'll, I'll turn it back to you to see how you'd like to proceed if we want to give uh, folks a little bit more time or if you are comfortable wrapping up and, and giving folks time back on their calendar. Yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable if, if you're not seeing any public comments. And Amanda, did we have a slide that showed the upcoming dates of this committee? Could have, yes, I think the yes. next slide. I think. Next slide. There we go. There we go. Yes. So um, I want to thank each of you for giving your time to this effort for being, um, you know, we're, we're figuring it out together. There has never before been an impact committee in California. So we're all um, figuring out together how, how this group can be most impactful, how we can use your time, your expertise, your firsthand experience um, for the good of the master plan. So we will meet again on April 19th and we stand ready to assist you formally or informally if there's work that needs to be done between now and April 19th that we can support you with um, so that that meeting meets your needs. And um, any final thoughts from members of this group before we adjourn? There might be a couple. I'm seeing some activity in the chat and somebody had their hand raised. Maybe it was Andy and then put it down. So yeah, I, I was just, this is Andy. I was just going to um, suggest, Susan, that, you know, reading the paper, it looks like the Building Back Better federal initiative, which obviously affects a lot of what we're doing in California, may get reconfigured into smaller bills. And I just encourage us to continue to think about the California congressional delegation as a stakeholder and think about ways we can feed them information and ideas as they're trying to recalibrate what to do with building back better. Thank you, Andy. We also saw um, a, a generous offer by Julia that it looks like the group has accepted. So we'll work, we'll work with you on that. And we really do encourage you on, on February 1st to come learn more about workforce. Um, any other thoughts from the group before we close for the day? Looks like we have somebody uh, from the attendee side who has their hand raised. So I'm wondering if we can turn to them for just a moment, Susan. Sure. Great, and we'll open uh, the line. I, I, know, I know you're listed as Norbert Deonda, so maybe you could introduce yourself briefly. Your line's open, but you'll need to unmute on your end as well.
Okay. It looks like you might still be muted. So um, Susan, I, I will pass it back to you and I'll just keep an eye and see if we can get the, uh, our attendee to. Okay. Well, we'll go ahead and conclude the meeting then. And I just want to thank um, Maria and Amanda, especially for their, and Norbert for their fantastic staff support with the agenda and preparation for the meeting. We look forward to seeing all of you on um, at the anniversary summit later this week and at the workforce webinar on February 1st. And thank you for your continued support and participation. And to any public members who joined us, thank you for being here today.